Take a look at this video I'm about to show you. Can you see how the trains are on two slightly different levels? Did you see that there? Did you see how there was a difference in height between the two trains? Can you guess why? Now take a look at this picture on the 6th Avenue line. Do you see how in the station, the tracks rise and then fall? The tiles are level. Here's a closer view. See how the tracks rise towards the center of the station and then they fall. Can you guess what that's for? Well, it's a, I think, a brilliant design feature and that's also part of the 1891 original subway design. And I'm gonna tell you all about it in just a minute. So welcome to Making Infrastructure Pay. I'm Kyle Kirschling. This is part of a series on the design of the New York City subway. And again, we're talking about stations at apices. And apices is plural for apex. It is also apparently fine to say apexes, but I prefer apices. It has a nice ring to it. So can you guess what, the, what it's for? On the underground lines, so far as possible, stations have been located at summits of gradients, both in order to get them as near the surface as possible, and also that the ascending gradient may be utilized in braking and the descending grade, grade to help acceleration. So there's sort of two purposes, to be close to the surface, but they really focus more on the speed to help the trains slow down when they get to the station and to speed up when they leave. The station should be located as far as possible at the apices of street gradients so that the opposing grade, which on approaching stations could be increased beyond the ruling figure, will gradually bring the train to rest. And then the train on starting will find a descending grade to assist it. This will materially increase the running time of trains. I think he means decrease the running time of trains and will be a saving in operation since the energy of the moving train will not be totally destroyed by the application of brakes, but will be stored by running the train to a summit. And then one of the consulting engineers chimes in saying, I wish to commend the proposal of Mr. Parsons to locate gradients on the approaches to local stations, wherever it is practicable to do so in order to assist the trains, both in slowing up on arriving and in getting rapidly underway on departing. There's a lot of quotes about this in different places. I wish I could share them all, but I think you get the idea of what it's for, especially the speed. That seems to be the most important thing that they're interested in with this. So we looked at this picture. You can see how it rises towards the center and falls. Uh, this is an express station uh, where there's, there's four tracks, all the trains stop here. Uh, the video I showed was actually of this station. This is 33rd Street and Park Avenue. Um, it's interesting for, this station is some ways more interesting for other reasons because it has three levels of transit. There was a subway, the four tracks, and you've got the streetcar uh, on Park Avenue and then a the separate tunnel. And then on 34th Street, the other direction, you have more streetcars, so three levels of transit. Um, but I think you can see a little bit here how the local tracks on the outsides are a bit higher. This is a wall and the express tracks are slightly depressed. Here's another picture of it. This is looking south, the other direction. Um, this is from a brochure that the Interborough Rapid Transit Company uh, produced when they first opened the subway. An interesting feature at a local station where in order to obtain the quick acceleration in grade for our local trains, and at the same time maintain a level grade for the express service, the tracks are constructed at a different level. This occurs at many local stations. So the local tracks are rising. So essentially the express tracks are not really depressed. They're just continuing straight through. So I came with this diagram to kind of illustrate it because this is, so this is just from my own observations from writing the system. It seems like there are two different types. There are some, which I'm just calling a hump apex where it's level at the station and then the grades are before and after it. And then this one, I'm just calling a pointed apex where the hump is right in this, is centered right on the station. For instance, so this is more like the pointed style and the others, this is like a, a hump apex where the tracks are level within the station. And 
this seems to be used on the older subway lines from the aughts and the teens. And this seems to be on the ones from the more recent 20s, 30s, 40s. And I can see, again, I don't know why they chose one over the other, but I, there seem to be some pros and cons to each of them. So normally, if you have a right sort of train operator, they won't start breaking until they're already, you know, well into the station. So by having the grades outside the, the station, it's going to tend to slow the trains down really before they should, before you would want them to slow down. So having it this way is probably a little bit better because you, you're getting the, it's going to help you slow them down once you're closer to the station or, and in the station. And then you could see the same thing kind of just leaving. So if you imagine this is a train, it's just a car because of the way I drew it, but imagine this is a train leaving, leaving the station. Um, you can see with this, with this hump apex, as it's leaving, half the train's on the hill, half is not. But with this point apex, by the time it's halfway out, it's already getting the full benefit of gravity pushing it out. But the, on the other hand, though, with this design, this older design, it's going to be easier to be close to the surface. With this pointed apex, if you have, say, a 3% grade of the tracks, by the, at the end of the platform versus the middle of the platform, you're talking about maybe a 10 foot difference or even more. So that's pretty significant. I mean, I think there are ways you could do it, like depending on where you put your mezzanines, where it wouldn't be a problem. But because as you know, they're very concerned about having the stations close to the surface, that would be an extra 10 feet for people at the potentially at the ends of the platforms. And there's one other thing that I want to talk about that is uh, sort of related. It's almost like a slightly uh, this idea on a slightly larger scale. So this is the Lexington Avenue line, and it's the four, five, six. And here, we, if we zoom in a bit, um, so again, this is a profile view, the same uh, view as uh, we've been looking at here from the side. The top line, that's it says a street surface, it's a surface. This line is the local tracks, the track level, and then this is, these are the express tracks. So at 42nd Street, all the tracks are on one level. But then as it shifts from Park Avenue to Lexington Avenue, it stacks because Lexington Avenue is relatively narrow. It's only 75 feet wide. Most of the avenues are 100 feet wide, and Park Avenue is even wider still. But it ha they had to stack it. So it separates into two levels, but then the local trains continue to stay up right below the surface, whereas the express trains go straight through and they don't come back up to the surface until you get to 86th Street, which is the next express stop. And if you're from New York, you might be saying, well, isn't there an express stop at 59th Street? And there is now, but that wasn't actually built until the 1950s. So if, so if you, that's, why if you've taken if you've gone to that station it's very inconvenient because the express tracks are very deep down it's a long escalator ride that escalators out it's a long walk um and it's a it's not a convenient place to transfer from local to express but this was originally there was no stop there so that's why it looks the way it does and this this idea of using gravity in this way gave me and i it helped inspire me to come up with a, a different sort of form of transportation, which I call the gravitator. And I'll probably do a separate video on this, but I just want to mention it because this was definitely part of the inspiration for that idea. So I'm almost sort of, I'm sort of taking that idea and just pushing it even further. So again, another profile view, we're looking at the side of it. What I'm doing is having the, the tracks dip down much deeper between the stations. So you can actually get to much higher speeds. Um, on a traditional subway, a rapid transit system, really the limiting factor for your braking and acceleration rates have to do with passenger comfort. You can't really go much, you can't really accelerate or decelerate much faster without causing people a lot of discomfort. So that's the limiting factor. If you had like a Hyperloop or something, 
in the city, it wouldn't help you because by the time you, you got up to any speed, you'd be way past your stop. So within an urban area, to make travel faster, you need some way to get around that. And what by using gravity to help assist you, it's not just more efficient, but you accelerate in a sense partly by falling. So the G-forces are much less. And even though it's a, it is technically longer, this is a longer distance than this because it's not a straight line, but it's only slightly longer and it allows you to get much, you're able to get much higher speeds with the same, without causing more G-forces on the passengers. And because it, you can also use this then to have the stations at the surface, which they don't even have to be underground. They can be at the surface, which makes it even more convenient if you design it right. And then what you can also do because of the really high speed you get is you can build this over a relative, you know, over a short distance, say up to two miles, because it's so fast, you know, it might be like uh, 90 seconds, like two minutes or something to cover two miles. You really, you, you can have pretty frequent service if it's a shuttle with just a single tunnel. So that means, again, this is a plan view looking down at the track. So you can have just a single, a single tunnel, which makes your tunnel construction costs way lower because you only need one, you don't need two, up to say maybe two miles. And these are some examples of the kinds of things you could build with this. And because it's so much cheaper to build, um, there's a lot more situations where it would pay, it would be profitable to build something like this. And you can go, if you're interested at subsetting.com, um, there's a paper you can download. It's not mainly about the Gravitator, but it includes, you can see the details on some of these specific projects, including a connection for LaGuardia Airport to the subway, a connection between Penn Station and Grand Central. Um, and then this would be another way to, to connect it to, say, a new development site that's not really close to transit. So... That is stations at apices. It's literally an inspiring idea to me. And I think it's just brilliant. I think it, it shows how well the 1891 design works together as a system for sharing this with you guys. I tried to break it out into the different elements. So four tracks for the local and express. Why is it underground? And why are this platforms close to the surface and, and things like that? But really it makes a lot more sense as a system. And this is just another as an integrated system. And this is just another little brilliant touch because it works perfectly with, it's going to be underground. You want the stitch, the stations to be close to the surface and you want it to be fast. And this, it works well with all of those. So it seems like instead of making trade-offs, they came up with ideas that really required no trade-off in many, in many, in many situations. So I just, I just find that brilliant and inspiring. And I want to share that with you guys. Um, that's our show for today. Uh, until next time, I'm Kyle Kirschling. And thank you for listening. And if you enjoy this, please like and subscribe.